As Margaret Atwood wrote of Tilly Olson in the New York Times Book Review, quote, Few writers have gained such wide respect on such a small body of published work. Perhaps this is because women writers, even more than their male counterparts, recognize what a heroic feat it is to have held down a job, raised four children, and still somehow managed to become and to remain a writer. Tilly Olson was born to parents who were politically active Jewish immigrants, and she jumped right into supporting various social causes. Tilly joined the Young Communist League at the age of 18 and worked various labor jobs while remaining politically active. Olson was arrested twice for her political activities, including organizing workers at a packing house in Kansas City. Her experiences in the slaughterhouses inspired her to write about the terrible conditions there. Olson's writing during the 1930s was in the vein of contemporary radical fiction, which was popular during that era. The aim of such fiction was to use art for political and social ends, and Olson was determined to write about marginalized people, those who got no respect from the mainstream society. In 1934, she published The Iron Throat, a piece against capitalism, Thousand Dollar Vagrant, a fictionalized account of her arrest, and The Strike, an account of a violent clash between police and striking longshoremen. But then Olson took a very long break to raise her four children. She began writing again in the mid-1950s after receiving a fellowship from Stanford University. A few years into the fellowship, she received a Ford Foundation grant and wrote Tell Me a Riddle, which won the O. Henry Award and was first published in 1961, when Tilson was then in her late 40s. The story I Stand Here Ironing, perhaps her most well-known work, is the first piece that appears in Tell Me a Riddle. Mostly grounded in her own experiences as a mother, the story breaks new literary ground in creating the voice of a mother narrator and in crafting a narrative structure that mirrors as well as describes female experience. I Stand Here Ironing portrays the hardship of poverty and exclusion, but also the ability to transcend them. The story's apparent simplicity belies its complex narrative structure, as many critics have pointed out, and its rich pattern of imagery. The narrative remains anchored in the present because of the act of ironing, which is familiar to the mother narrator, who has experienced, as Olson did, interruptions throughout her life. Olson later published her novel, Yonandio, almost 40 years after she started it. Described by some critics as one of the best novels about life in the 1930s, Yonondio details the life of a poor family, the Holbrooks, during the Depression. The novel was well received, although some critics found it too depressing. But despite this, it was named one of the most important works of its time, and many critics praise Olson's ability to lyrically render the rhythms of consciousness and of the victims of poverty. In her later years, Olson really became a champion of women writers, and she set, shed light on the reasons behind the underrepresentation of women authors and their work, in particular those women from poor backgrounds. Olson's work was recognized during the 1970s feminist movement, and really she was recognized for paving the way for new opportunities for women writers. In this brief excerpt from a 2007 biography about Olson, you will hear Alice Walker, among others, discuss Olson's importance as a feminist writer and as an intellectual. Tilly 
I think is responsible for changing the landscape of feminist writing and reading. So many names nobody would have known. And, and people were not reading, and they would not have republished without Tilly's prodding and her fiery enthusiasm for the writing. Less than a year after the feminist press began, Tilly Olson gave me a very tattered copy of Life in the Iron Mill and said, don't read it at night. So of course I proceeded to read it that night. Didn't sleep a wink, but knew by morning that if this had been lost, many, many more gems of literature had been lost. And the feminist press's mission began from that gift. And that's why I call Tilly the mother of us all. She then made me read Daughter of Earth by Agnes Smedley when I had 104 temperature and was in her bed. <laughs> but I had to read it before she would call the doctor. Absolutely. <laughs> what she did, in fact, was to start all of us on this excavation, uh, on this search for the lost feminist or even female gems of literature that had been lost mainly because of male neglect.